Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, this gathering with Then Let Us Sing, uh, members of the Development Committee. This event is going to be a bilingual one with English and French. To access the language of your choice, please hover over the globe, and then you can choose English or French as you would like. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue. Je m'appelle Adèle Halliday et je travaille pour le Conseil général de l'Église unie du Canada. Et je suis la responsable de l'équité et la lutte contre la, le racisme. Et je suis très contente que vous êtes ici aujourd'hui. Nous sommes ici avec, les, uh, avec quelques membres de Chantons Ensemble. With, uh, then let us sing. Uh, and um, the members of the team will introduce themselves as the evening goes along. We will start uh, this evening with a video uh, with Lloyd McLean, and the video will introduce uh, Then Let Us Sing, and the members of Then Let Us Sing will continue to introduce themselves as we go along. So welcome once again. We are glad you're here for this event for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism with Then Let Us Sing. So let's begin with the video, please. My name is uh, Jean Appel Lloyd McLean. Welcome, bienvenue. I chair the Then Let Us Sing project. Uh, before the pandemic, when we used to meet in person, a number of church people interested in music from across our church and beyond met in Toronto. We had been invited to discuss the possibility of developing an ecumenical hymn resource. So there were people uh, from the United Church of Christ in the USA, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, the Anglican Church of Canada, and the Disciples of Christ and our own United Church folk. As we talked, we realized that our existing United Church uh, resources met many of the requirements for an ecumenical resource, and it did not take long before the discussions uh, mentioned the approaching centennial of the United Church in 2025. Also, plans were already in place for completing the digital availability of gathering our periodical worship resource. With the addition of uh, new material, primarily material not vetted or published by any of our uh, existing resource earlier committees, what was shaping up as our centennial project would be digitization of those existing resources plus new material with complete cross-indexing and compatibility with gathering online. Then COVID arrived, so all work had to be done through digital online meetings. Several subcommittees were created, Education, Justice and Ethos, Materials Creation, Marketing, Animation and Funding, and Web Content Development. Ads uh, were posted and additional people were added to those various subcommittees. We've had strong support from the offices of the moderator and general secretary and excellent staff support with very enthusiastic participation. Also, also notable are our corporate partners, Hope Publishing, who are taking care of uh, engraving all the material, and GIA, who will make available our entire resource catalog through one license Many United Churches already use one license to legally copy, project, and stream material. Then let us sing Ensemble Chantant. Thank you. Merci. Merci, Lloyd. Welcome, everyone, to Lloyd. this webinar. In this webinar, we hope to introduce a little bit about who we are, the Then Let Us Sing Committee, but really our focus is on how anti-oppression is built into the bedwork and the framework of what we are doing with Then Let Us Sing. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time in this next hour singing and having some discussion with various members of the Then Let Us Sing Committee on racism in music, how we recognize and 
experience racism within our music and liturgy and then how we are being proactive about that within then let us sing and the learnings that we have been taking from that proactive work and how that is translating into our current worship life and music life and suggestions for all of us on how we can continue to do that work as we as we continue to create then let us sing so i'm gonna I'm going to put in the chat the members of Then Let Us Sing that I know of that are here. If you are a member of Then Let Us Sing and I don't know that you're here, please, um, you know, put a reaction, put a happy face or a smiley face or a frowny face in the in the in the reaction so that you can introduce yourself to everyone. Then Let Us Sing is an amazing community of folks who are working together. So we are so glad and delighted to share a little bit of our community process with you tonight. So Catherine, okay, pass it on to you. Um, thank you, merci. And it's a joy to be with you all this evening. Um, I have the pleasure of playing with these folks as we are preparing um, a new a new hymn resource, a new song resource, and looking over the music that we have shared that has made our hearts sing over the years in in our current three hymnals. As part of the Then Let Us Sing group, I have been of late the lead in the subcommittee that is called Education, Justice, and Ethos. Education, Justice, and Ethos. And we will be looking at some of the promotions for the hymn resource and so on. But at the very beginning, it was really important to figure out why we sing and what it is that we will sing. We have all kinds of choices. We have all kinds of choices. And so in figuring it out, what it is that we will sing, as Augustine said, those who sing pray twice, there is the music and there are the lyrics. And there is the, the voice of all of us, C to C to C, who do the singing. And there are the voices and the ingenuity of the people who write the music and those who write the words. And so there are so many choices. The task of creating a new collection meant taking on that responsibility of suggesting future possibilities and knowing that you know churches sing what, what they will sing and so on. But this, this particular piece is going to bring enthusiasm, guidance, possibility for this next generation in our singing life. And so we, we began by putting together a theoethical framework a theoethical framework. The theoethical framework was intended to give us a, a sense of what kind of music we need to be looking for, who would be writing that kind of music, how we would be singing that music, and why we would be choosing it. And so it was important, we understood, to look at the named priorities of the General Council. And we made a commitment in our theoethical framework, that we would celebrate the image of God in all peoples and cultures and in creation, that we would choose hymns and songs that lift up the intercultural and anti-racist commitments of the church, choosing hymns and songs that will lift up the intercultural and anti-racist commitments of the church. And we do that by selecting material that prioritizes Black, Indigenous, people of color, French speaking, LGBTQ, 22S voices, and the voices, the music, the hymnody of people with disabilities. And so we knew that we would need to be actively soliciting this material, that we would be choosing material that would bring these particular priorities into our singing life, and that would be lifting our hearts, um, using emancipatory language, acknowledging that there is room for lament, there is room for confession, and that there is lots of room for fresh language about God and honest language about who we are and significantly, who we understand the church will be, who we understand 
the church will be. This is an enormous task. And having a theoethical framework to begin looking for that material and evaluating that material was absolutely critical to the work. I want to give you one phrase that our education justice and ethos subcommittee thought was really helpful for the church. And I want you to know that over the course of these couple of years, we got started in April of 2020, that, that date may mean something to some of you. Um, over that time, the eight or so of us who have been part of this work in putting together the theoethical framework and bringing the, the, the ethos of the church and who we understand the church needs to be in the new generation. Here's the phrase that we thought summed it up. Faithful song as antidote to fear. Faithful song as antidote to fear. That we can animate congregational song as an antidote to the variety of fears that are around us. And that in singing each other's songs, we, we grow in our own communities and in the world, but faithful song as antidote to fear takes us into the honesty of who we are and of who we have been. And a significant part of that we know is acknowledging, lamenting, and making reparations for our life in church as being, as being racist. I'll leave you there for now. Thank you, Catherine. That phrase really has helped so many of the Then Let Us Sing committees dream and shape the work. So we're so grateful for that. Thank you. And thank you to the EGE team for the amazing work that has been done and is continuing to be done. We need to take a quick pause to reset the recording so we don't miss any more golden gems for people who are listening online or later. As, um, as Catherine, has just mentioned, we know that the church, we know that anti-oppression, we know that oppression, and we know that racism lives in the church. And as such, we know that racism is in church music. When we were preparing for this webinar and when we were preparing for our work in general, we had asked some questions of ourselves. When, for instance, like, when is racism most apparent to us when we are looking at church music? How is racism woven into our hymnody and church music life? And because we are coming into the season of Advent, how is racism prevalent in Advent church music? We had these questions and we thought that Emmo from the EGE, Education, Justice and Ethos Committee, and Bruce Harding, who is our music editor and part of the editorial team would be two excellent people from Then Let Us Sing to engage us in those questions. So I'll turn it over to you two, maybe starting with Emil. All right, thanks, <clears throat> Alidia. Um, <clears throat> I'll start by giving a definition of what anti-racism is within the context of our, our tonight, tonight's uh, theme. But the definition I'll be giving might be familiar to some of you, especially those who have taken the church's racial justice workshop. So the definitions are excerpted from the workshop and they align with our anti-racism work under the lead of Adele Holiday. So at, when we say anti-racism, racial justice, just to, to look at the two, anti-racism and racial justice are related terms, but should not necessarily be used interchangeably. And racial justice describes the utopic and intercultural dream where people of all races are engaged in equitable communities and where people are treated fairly and without racial discrimination, where unjust power is dismantled and where all are welcome. Anti-racism though is a verb. It includes specific recognition of the presence of racism and the sustained active efforts to overcome it. So tonight we're looking at the doing of this rather than the, the theoretical aspect of what is anti-racism. We'll try to do that tonight. In the context of systems, though, because the United Church of Canada is a one system, is a big uh, denomination, and we need to look at an anti-racist denomination then is one that actively works at dismantling racism and white supremacy at all levels of the church, continues to work at decolonizing its theology 
and strives to redistribute racial power more fairly. It does this anti-racism work so that people from all racial backgrounds can participate in the church's life fully and freely. And that's from what is an anti-racist denomination document of the United Church of Canada. Um, we will, I will put a, cop, I put a copy of this in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. So I'm, I'm looking at um, racism in our hymnody, and this is in our historical repertoire and in the work that we've been doing with Then Let Us Sing. And, and part of what we've been asking ourselves is, are there hymns that we need to let go of because they're problematic? You know, all of those kinds of questions, like looking at our historical repertoire, and we're not touching most of our existing repertoire, but there, there, there are moments where we, we pause and look. I just, I said while we were planning this that, you know, we have a long history of dropping hymns that no longer work in our current context. And this is an example of one of those hymns from Greenland's Icy Mountains. Um, a favorite hymn of the mission, mission work um, throughout, the, um, throughout the, the English, the British Empire. And um, the version that we had, and this is from the 1930 hymnary, the first United Church hymn book. This one's much cleaner than earlier versions even. Some of the verses that were even more problematic were dropped. So you can already tell in 1930 that people were realizing how, how racist our whole missionary tradition has been and how it was reflected in our hymns. So next slide. Thanks, Brian. In our current books, there are still songs that, that are problematic. A hymn like Jesus Shall Reign by one of our greatest poets, Isaac Watts. You know, Isaac Watts took Psalm 72 and Christianized it right up front. So he's taking Jewish scripture and, and turning it into a Christian prayer, which in itself is an inherently um, racist, empirical kind of a, a thing to do. So Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth, does its successive journeys run. And yet this is still part of our, our major canon today. And we tend to forget that it's based on a psalm and all that that entails. Uh, Lydia mentioned Advent and the season of Advent. You can go to the next slide again, Brian. Advent is a time when if it, one of the one of the things that we deal with in terms of imagery in um, our work is is trying to find more helpful ways to express darkness and light in our current context. And people always point to Advent as time, but darkness and light is a part of Advent. And yes, it is. Light in the darkness is an ancient image for Advent. So the question is, you know, how helpful can be we, we be with many of these things? I, I put verse one of, oh, sorry, you can go flip back that one slide. Thank you. I put verse one up here of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, just as an example of, of once again, this is, this is an anti-Jewish kind of a verse, not as bad as in many cases, but you know, ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. Like, yes, the Jewish tradition is messianic, but, but once again, coming at it from a Christian perspective, which which puts Israel as being you know, in lowly exile, waiting for, for the appearance of the Messiah as we know the Messiah, is another example of, of um, anti-Semitic kinds of um, thought in our history. Now, moving on to the next slide, these are darkness and light images, because people say, but, but what do you do with them? Well, I've concluded a couple of verses from hymns where the darkness and light imagery is not so helpful. In VU 30 there, you've got to give them songs for sighing, their darkness turned to light, whose souls condemned to dying are precious in his sight. So it's, it's, it's putting a negative spin on darkness, their darkness, the poor and the needy, their darkness. So that's a negative spin on the word darkness. In the second example, oh, how joyful, oh, how peaceful sleeps the world on Christmas night. Sins are covered, grace discovered, in our darkness shines the light. So once again, it's darkness as a metaphor for you know, for all that is wrong in, in the world. So not as helpful, but the next slides give an example of, of darkness and light in a more helpful kind of a way. 
a candle is burning. A flame warm and bright, a candle of hope in December's dark night. So it just names darkness as, as night as being a dark time. And the candle is the flame, the, the brightness in the middle of that darkness. So it's a much simpler kind of an image which recognizes light in the darkness. And same with, with that's the complete text for, for number 19 in Voices United. Kindle a flame to lighten the dark and take all fear away. So relatively simple image. So we're, we are doing this kind of work as we're assessing new repertoire within the Then Let Us Sing as well. We're looking at, at the images in the text and saying to ourselves, is that helpful? Is it not? Is there another way we could phrase this? Could we find permission to, to we ask for permission to, to change language? Because you take, you take a certain kind of an image, if you phrase it in a certain way, it works for everyone, everyone rather than singling out some people and having some people say this hymn's more for these people than it is for others. So we're, we're just trying to prioritize that in our work. And when we can't change language, and if we really still want a song in there, then we provide asterisk alternatives to, to make it clear that, that we're not entirely thrilled with the words as they are presented, and there are other ways we could sing this that would be more helpful. So that's just a quick little romp through, through um, some of the historical issues with our song and some of the current issues in Advent in particular, darkness and light. Thank you, Bruce. As material creations and as the committee continues to go through pieces, there are so many pieces where we, we all kind of go, oh, ah, e. but our, how we address those pieces and how we, how we approach them isn't just our spidey sense, which is important, like it's important to trust our spidey sense, but we're also trying to ground our work within a theological framework and realizing that my perspective will be different from someone else's perspective and what and the feelings that evoke for me will be different from someone else because of our lived experiences. So we understand that racism and oppression is within our music and it's within our history, it's within our canon, it's within the things that shape that have shaped and molded us within the hymns that we love. Some of those hymns, as Bruce has said, we have already retired and some need to be retired. And as the Then Let Us Sing committee, we have been working really intentionally to make sure that anti-oppression and anti-racism is woven into every aspect of our work together. So one of the questions that we know has come up more than a few times is how is that being done? So how is anti-racism and anti-oppression woven into then let us sing? And how are we being proactive and respectful of cultural differences? How are we doing that in the material creations process? I'll tell you a little bit about how we've taken the theoethical framework that um, EGE, Education, Justice and Ethos has created and shaped pieces of our work. And then I'll invite Josh from material creations to share a little bit about how that's being lived out in the actual curation or collecting of new musical resources. So some of the things that we are doing because of the work of EGE, Education Justice Ethos, I'll try not to use acronyms, is we've created guiding principles on language. And we have four guiding principles that we work with on language in the new hymn collection. We try, our first principle is we will honor and respect the language of origin whenever and however possible. So if a hymn is from, is of Spanish origin, one way we can honor the Spanish origin of that hymn is by putting it in Spanish first in the hymn book. The second thing that we are trying to do is we have a principle to make Then Let Us Sing accessible in multiple languages. We really want our hearts, we really want the church to be able to sing in the language of our hearts. And we know that there are over 80 languages that are actively worshiping within the United Church of Canada. And we really wanna honor that and to have that reflected in the hymn book. I know we don't have the pages to have every hymn in every language, but we are doing our best to, to create spaces where people can sing in their heart's language. We will encourage congregational singing as much as possible. As Catherine had said, we really see the work of animating congregational song as 
a very real and tangible antidote to the fear and anxieties that hinder us proclaiming the gospel and hinder us doing God's work and building God's kingdom in these challenging times for the church. So we realize that in our singing, we can share signs of hope and signs of lament and signs of life. So then let us sing, we believe is an investment in the future of the church, expression of who we are and who we want to become. And that kind of who we want to become piece gets in with the congregational singing. So we're trying to create, put songs in there that people love to sing and will love to sing together. The fourth guiding principle that we have is when a multitude of languages and translations are available, we're going to do our best to make a judgment call based on these other guiding principles and we'll, and we'll determine as best we can what order they'll appear. So we know, for instance, there are some hymns and I'm sure Bruce and Josh and others can speak to it that we have in our collection, Amazing Grace, for example, I think we can put it in 80 languages in itself and we can't quite get all those languages on the page. So we're gonna do our best to put what we can, realizing that this is a growing resource and the joy of having something digitally is that we can always add to it. And if we get it wrong, we can, we can work with these documents and change them. We've also spent a lot of time thinking about how to do this work respectfully and how to be respectful of others. In this respect, we've been doing a lot of work thinking of our theology of copyright. And we've created a theology of copyright statement. We're working with others in discussing copyright and copyright justice. That could be a whole other webinar in itself. But in our theological statement on copyright, that is how we live together respectfully and how we respect and honor the, contr the contributions of people and their intellectual property. We have four other guiding principles that we're working with. The first is to follow all legal requirements around intellectual property laws, just as a baseline. The second is to attempt to deepen relationships. So to realize that using someone else's work or a community's work is not just is not just about them it's about a relationship with them we also want to work towards reparation restoration and right relations we realize that a lot of exploitation has gone on a lot of unfairness we realize that a lot of the copyright practices favor and are really built to support western white european musicians so how can we work towards restoration and right relations and make sure that we are not adding to the exploitation of people in their works or communities and cultures? Our fourth principle is to seek justice and equity at all times. And we are working to do that in the arrangements that we choose or select, or in some cases where the money goes. So there are hymns within the, um, More Voices had, started this work and securing copyright to pieces that didn't have um that were from other places that didn't have copyright secured so that we could make sure that the money for the song goes as close to the source as possible i'll put some more information about this in the chat the other so i know that's a lot i'm talking a lot I will say also that at the end of our questions here, we will have a time for Q&A, so you can feel free to put questions in the chat. We might not answer them right away, but in about 10 minutes, we'll have a Q&A time to answer those questions. The third piece I wanted to talk about before passing it to Josh was how we are working as a committee. So we have these theological principles and these guiding principles that we are working with, and then as a committee, how we are trying to live into that is I feel like as a group, we speak only for ourselves. We are a large group. We have different people coming in representing different things, but on the committee, we are there as ourselves and representing ourselves alone. And I think we have a real village community model in how then Let Us Sing is working and being together. And our aim really is to listen, to consult and to learn from others we work towards and we work through a consensus model. So everyone on the committee has the power 
to pause or to veto a discussion if they're feeling uncomfortable. And I think that really helps us in creating the sort of place where we can wrestle with things until we get it right. And we're prayerfully attempting to make informed decisions. So whenever we get to a place where there's a question or a wondering or spidey sense kickoff, then we know that we can consult with other team members. We go back to EGE and say, can you help us do some work on this? We consult with other working groups and other, other, other partners within the church to get that work done. So we've been really working collaboratively as much as possible. And I think it's, I don't wanna speak for anyone on, on the committee, but I have been learning so much through the process and just talking with so many people. And I really value that. I'm going to pass it to you, Josh, about how how you feel material curations is kind of living into our anti-racism and anti-oppression framework. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm I'm Josh, and I'm the um, the interim chair of the material curation committee. Um, while our current chair Marin is on maternity leave um, and she and I were meeting today to talk about sort of steps going forward in looking at ways that we can actually share this role. Um, I think there, there are two particular things that I would uh, want to speak to um, in terms of what material curation does. Material curation being the, the committee or the subcommittee that most people would probably think of as the, the traditional group that is putting together a song collection. So we're the ones sorting through new submissions, previously published material, music from the contemporary church, from, in, from our intercultural partners and sources. Um, and we are trying to hold many of these pieces together. Um, this is a long process that has had many different parts and many different people involved. And one of the things that we did early on was engage in consultations, as Olivia mentioned, to reach out to our partners um, in different ethnic communities, in different task force or representing different um, perspectives on the church and um, ask them, what are they singing? What song do they bring? And these, these consultations unearthed song, but for the most part, in particular, started on that process of building relationship that we can go back to them and say, here's where we're at, or here's an issue that we're facing. How, how or what would you advise for us to go forward on this. Um, and we are looking really actively now as we get into the crux of, of selecting material to follow up on a lot of these consultations for um, the other voices, the voices that don't always make it into this place, into these places of power to um, help change or develop this collection. Um, and it is also that um, place of power that I think is worth talking about as, as a committee. Olivia talked about our consensus model. We all have the power to, um, to veto something if we really can't deal with it or to really fight for something if we do. Um, but we've made an effort to neutralize hierarchy within this group, both our committee and the larger project. Um, the reality, of course, is that power still gets wielded within our committee and the larger group. Um, and as a chairperson, I am particularly aware of the power that I wield or of the control that I possess over the process. Um, it is something that we, at least that I actively work to try and um, to wrestle with, to, to hold on to, to acknowledge that it's there, and to lean on those around me who have 
gifts, who have experience, who have expertise, who can bring to this discussion, um, to this process, those, those elements that, um, that can help us move in a different way. Um, the third, and I think most important thing I would want to uh, say about um, the work that we do is actually something that one of our committee members has said before. And Deb Bradley is here somewhere in the midst of all of you. Um, and Deb said something along the lines of, um, you can't say, I don't like this music without it meaning that I don't like these people. Um, and as we in engage, as we wrestle with song from a diversity of sources, we are also wrestling with um, the relationship or the, the, the meaning of that song, because song is always connected to people. It comes from within, from an individual, from a community, and goes out and is received by a community. It is inherently relational, personal, and dynamic. And so um, if we know that saying, I don't like this song, means that I'm actually saying, I don't like these people, how 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 do we confront then what what do, where does that take us when we in when engage with song um these are are questions that we don't really have answers to it's it's we are also learning as we do this and um as a as a practitioner of song my great teachers have always said you have to try, you have to go in and wrestle in it. And in the midst of that, lift up your wrestling, lift up your trying as prayer, that this be a prayer to God, that the question be raised, um, and to allow that to change how you are approaching, how we are approaching these questions going forward. Thank you, Josh. Amen. I couldn't agree more. And yeah, Deb and Monica are here for material creation. So it's great to have you both with us. The one of the um, one of the last questions that we wanted to address today was on the then let us sing development committee, we have been doing this work and we have been doing this wrestling and we've been prayerfully discerning what it means to sing other songs and how to do anti racism work. And one of the questions that we've been getting is, so how do we sing anti-racism now? How do we practice and prepare for then let us sing? What are the ways that we can sing songs respectfully now? What are some of the things that we can be doing to walk the walk, not to walk the walk, that's a bad analogy because it's ableist, but how, but how can we move forward together in this process? Uh, Bruce and Catherine, had two we thought would be two great people to help answer that question about how we can do the work of anti-racism and anti-oppression now how we can continually correct ourselves and question ourselves and learn and grow together thank you hi Catherine there she is again <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I was going to just lift up a song from Voices United and just spend a moment with it. So I think Brian's going to pull up a score for us. Some of you may know this song, 431 in Voices United. Um, this is an example of a piece that is it's presented in the original language and in English. I was teaching this at an Anglican cathedral in northwestern Ontario and I said do you know this song Amen we, uh, Amen Siakudumi Sa and they said nope never heard of it before I started to sing it and they say oh yes we sing that every week but we sing it only in English so I think there's one of your first ways that we can we can help to really get inside a song is to 
is to teach it in the original language. Teach it and help help our people learn it in the original language. I know a four verse hymn in Mandarin is going to be a bit much for congregations to handle necessarily, but but short phrases and all of that really makes a difference. Now a song like this, the title that's on the page is not helpful because the piece is actually Amen Si Yakudumi Sa. That is the name of the piece, the, the people's part, so to speak. The way it's presented on the page um, with tenors and basses having the leader's role. And I've seen congregations take that quite literally. So their, their men's section in the choir is standing there all singing that part together. But it's meant to be far more improvised. That is meant to be a part that um, a leader could come out of the community and start offering the call. Or you might have a designated leader in your community who can sing it. But when I teach this song, I teach it, speak it first. Amen si yaku du mi sa. So people get a sense for the language. Amen Baba, Amen Baba, Amen Siyaku Dumi Sa. And then we just sing the people's part all together. Amen Siyaku Dumi Sa. Amen Siyaku Dumi Sa. Amen Baba, Amen Baba, Amen Siyaku Dumi Sa. And we get that. We get that going, make sure people are singing it well, encourage people to make up some harmonies rather than have to read the parts that are on the page. This is a tradition that where harmonies are relatively, relatively simple and that invites people to make up their own harmonies. So just a way of getting inside the song. The way we present songs from other parts of the world on the page can be a problem. You know, in this case, this is a Dave Dargie arrangement and Dave has has been working in South Africa for decades and tends to transcribe what he hears from the people and also gives all of his copyrights back to the community. So that's an example of, of a good kind of an arrangement to have in the book. But it's just what, what hymn books do to repertoire is what we're, we're trying to, to address as well. How do we present songs in a way that, that um, opens them up for people, makes them accessible, honors the original source as much as we can and yet still still makes it accessible and relatively easy for people to approach in their congregational contexts. Thanks Bruce. I'm going to offer the group um, six questions, discussion starters, um, six different concepts that you might find useful in your context. And I'm thinking uh, you go to choir practice and go, oh dear, how do you address it? There's an Advent lunch for the congregation. You're looking for a program. Well, let's talk about racism in, in Advent carols. Oh, people are gonna show up for that. Uh, you're having a staff meeting and looking at um, Christmas carols to put on the video for the 25th of December, or your youth group is gathering and you say, look, let's look at the music that we sing, the heritage that we have, and where there might be racism, but what can we do about it? We are people of hope. We are people who are growing. We are people who, who carry on together as God's beloved community. So I'm going to give you six questions, and I'll, I'm going to put them in the, in the um, I, yes, I am going to put them in the chat. There is question number one. And um, you're working with a, a choir or you're in an Advent lunch or you're, you know, uh, the UCW is there. I'll tell you the power of women in their 80s and 90s to turn this world around is outstanding. So what makes you cringe? I was in Dorval Airport yesterday, walking through, minding my own business. I nearly swallowed my teeth. You can get a whole wardrobe. You can style a room around the song, Baby, It's Cold Out There. Now, does that make you cringe? That just gives, that's a whole store devoted to rape culture. So if I'm cringing, looking at a store that has done the styling for a room and a wardrobe around the popular song, Baby It's Cold Out There, what makes you cringe in any of our Christmas carols or our Advent carols? That would be a way into a conversation. That would be a way into a conversation. It might be that as the conversation carries on, you wonder about 
my own place or our own place in this conversation. Oh, I love that carol. I want to sing that carol. I love the old words. Mm -hmm. Well, how might my affection for a carol be in fact more selfish than community minded? That takes us out of nostalgia and into justice. My third suggestion for you, and I know that if you do um, command C, you can, you can capture these and put them in your own books, or maybe you've got a pencil. One way into any kind of hymnody, but certainly the carols is to ask, is anyone being diminished in this carol? Is anyone being diminished? And you've heard some conversation already about the diminishment of the Hebrew and Jewish stories that are part of the Old Testament, whether it's rewriting an entire Psalm or making some indication that finally we get it right. Here's the Christian answer. Is there anyone being diminished in this carol? And I suggest to you that um, that could be a very, very long and fascinating conversation. Is there anyone being diminished? To take that question a little deeper or to move it um, in a way that might be helpful is this next one. Um, is this piece diminishing Jewish heritage or fetishing poverty and race? There's something that happens at Christmas time when people get excited about giving and it has more to do with charity than justice. And it has to do with the sweetness of the manger, the poverty of the Holy Family. And I challenge you to find that in the scripture story. So deepening the question of who might be diminished in the carol is, does this particular piece diminish Jewish heritage or fetish? Does it fetish poverty? Does it fetish race? Um, and, and here, this is um, connected to that again. What I'm trying to do is take you a little bit deeper with each of these things. How does this old story become fresh? So, Really quickly, here's my Advent sermon from 2021, um, which is that as you read through the story, Jesus was not born into poverty and isolation. Jesus was born into a loving extended family, the extended family, the family of both the father and mother. We hear both about Joseph and Mary's background and the likelihood that he was born in a place where there were aunts and uncles and grandmothers and midwives, and that he was born not into some sweet poverty, but into a very warm, loving, caring family who would be looking after him from the beginning. So what I'm trying to do with this suggestion is say to you that as we look at the questions of racism in scripture, we uncover some things that have to do with long held assumptions by a white wealthy church that Jesus was born to brown people who were poor and that somehow that's sweet. Um, this is just, it, it just makes my, my teeth, puts my teeth on edge, but that's what I'm finding in here. If you want a resource for that particular one, I'm putting the name in the, the um, many of you may know Padre Gatwama, who was the lead for the Coromila um, community in Ireland. His writing on Advent will explode your preaching and your work with the choir and your work with the youth group and your work with the 80 and 90 year old UCW women as they get together to change the world once again because they're pretty skilled at it. And then finally, um, and this might be the easiest, um, I misnumbered that one, I'm so sorry. Really, one, two, three, four, six. So sorry. Um, here we go. This is really six. Just to simply sit and look at the light dark imagery and what that is really saying about what we think that is good and right. I lived in Yellowknife for six years. I learned a lot about the 
power and the warmth and the intimacy of the darkness. Well, what happens in the darkness in Yellowknife when you're living there for the entire winter? You find your friends and you party. You go to each other's houses. It's warm, it's neighborly, it's not the, um, the cold and diminished idea of darkness that we have that moves very quickly in understandings from isolation to racism. So let's look at light dark imagery and what we mean by um, shadow, that's a different word, illumination, that's a different word. And we can avoid the, the, uh, the skin toned concepts that have to do with good and bad that are so just deeply embedded in the work that we have. So a simple exercise, let's just sit down and work through this material and look at the light dark imagery. And then, then, then let's have a solstice service that really celebrates darkness. Let's have um, a, a choir evening that has to do with pulling through this material and going, I never thought of it this way. How am I going to change not only what I sing, how am I going to change what I understand about God's love, about community, about really being the beloved community? How do I, in these questions, decolonize the hymnody that I sing? How do I understand that as an anti-racist church, I have to look at the words that come out in those beautiful notes and think about singing something else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Bruce. Uh, just to welcome a few other committee members who are on the call, Kevin Park is here from marketing, animation, and fundraising. It's also Kevin's belated birthday. So happy belated birthday, Kevin. Uh, David is here as well. And I think well, we, we know about Monica and Deb. And I think I saw Chris Dumas also. So welcome to the rest of the committee here. This kind and Deb, we mentioned also this dream of the beloved community and how we live into it is paramount to all that we do and are doing. I'm wondering before we open it up to questions, if I can uh, ask if there's anyone on the committee or if um, David Roger or Kofi have anything that they would like to add or are there questions that we missed to the committee members or things that you really think that we should be saying to right now? Go ahead, David Roger. Okay, je peux commencer. Um... Bien, comme vous saviez, notre langue sure. est racinée dans le concept de genre. Uh, Donc, déjà, know, dès le début, c'est un grand défi aujourd'hui. Parce que it's, it's de in, parler strictement en termes de mâles et femelles, because da, we en 1950, 90, good, ça fonctionnait. En 2023, uh, it used to ça ne fonctionne plus. Donc, il y a un grand défi vérifier que notre in order to nous référence de nom concorde de notre nouvel concept euh, de, uh, de comment on s'identifie comme être humain. Uh, on a commencé à aborder ça avec le projet de nouveaux unis il y a une quinzaine d'années, mais with, uh, on n'était pas Unis, là où nous sommes aujourd'hui à ce moment-là. We uh, on, on, on travaille aussi en français pour changer now. des termes. Vous avez so mentionné la question de noirceur. Um, uh, on cherche souvent la musique concept, mondiale, uh, mais parfois on est confronté avec des images théologiques qui s'accordent peut-être moins avec notre réalité culturelle. En Amérique du Nord, il y a des des dialogues de, 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 de possibilités de changement de texte. Uh, uh, J'aimerais juste suggérer so que quand nous faisons des this. traductions so, en français uh, pour uh, like nos films, uh, uh, que le Google uh, Translate n'est peut-être pas la meilleure ressource I possible. Like uh, uh, et j'explique pourquoi. Is uh, not the best. Oui, des fois, And Google Translate yes, fait une bonne traduction approximative But it can de do, mots. Uh, only Mais le français, you know, comme vous savez, uh, est une langue But très you know, nuancée. French is a Et c'est pour ça que nous prenons 15 mots pour dire en français, ce que vous prenez en 4-5 mots pour dire en anglais. Uh, la, that, les nuances uh, sont essentielles. Et les images 
à travers so, ces nuances sont aussi essentielles. So, uh, Et donc, these, uh, je vous invite, si vous vous embarquez dans les projets uh, images, de, de traduction, s'il so, uh, so vous plaît, consultez careful. des francophones. <laughs> Ça sera, Please, les francophones seront ravis de de travailler avec vous Try et aider parce qu'il y a des choses qui sont pas de la même façon dans la langue française qu'en euh, anglais et donc ou, ou d'autres langues. Um, donc, le, le nuance des images so we'll really have to est, est très importante uh, dans la langue. Uh, of the images dans la, that dans to, le contexte francophone, uh, je dirais que nous, In the French context, nous nous voyons à ne pas avoir peur de chanter les choses difficiles. Euh, on a parlé de, de, de lamentation, euh, on chante uh, des we, choses parfois we have qui semblent confronter la réalité, mais au plan culturel, uh, je pense que c'est quelque chose qui est très important de faire. Ça context, fait partie de cheminement dans une prise de conscience collective. Et donc, euh, pour nous, on cherche souvent des choses qui vont nous lancer le défi pour dire, oh, attendez une minute, donc, euh, vous avez fermé la porte dans le, dans, dans le visage de quelqu'un. Uh, regarde donc ça. Instance, pas peut-être pas tout à fait facile à dire dans un livre, mais on, on us, cherche des façons de, de dire très clairement c'est quoi l'exclusion, c'est quoi le racisme. C'est vrai so, que pour If la plupart des communautés francophones we will try en Amérique du Nord, nous avons une uh, connexion respect, avec un America, contexte culturellement catholique. Et je choisis we très précisément mes termes. Donc, cette context. réalité va colorer, va nuancer uh, la musique que nous, nous avons dans nos, dans nos cultes. Et, et parfois, même on, on va aller chercher services. certaines choses dans les répertoires de nos, uh, nos cousins et cousines go uh, dans la communauté catholique parce que certaines uh, choses sont in, uh, possibles, ça s'accorde assez bien avec la théologie. Because, et donc, c'est un contexte uh, culturel aussi uh, que j'inviterai uh, qu'on ne perd pas uh, nécessairement vu. Et donc, like c'est so, à peu près uh, ça. Juste pour lancer le défi qu'il y a des uh, francophones this partout is what I wanted to say au to Canada. Et donc, uh, si vous lancez say, un petit en français de temps à autre, par chance, going vous going allez attraper un francophone, francophone qui va être ravi French, de ce message-là qu'on est tous aussi inclus dans, dans le champ de l'église. So et donc, uh, merci juste uh, de me permettre de, de soulever ces points-là. Je ne sais pas si c'est courtier. Of the French language. So partage. thank you very much because it is a concern to us. Merci, uh, merci David Roger, and yes, it's definitely you, a concern. Thank you, David Roger. And we do uh, hope effet, to. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, and we do hope to do as much consulting as possible throughout the resource. So thank you for that. Uh, was there anything else from others from the committee? We did have one question in the chat that I have here are around audio resources. And are there audio resources, good audio resources to learn pronunciation for other languages? Would anyone here like to answer that? Well, I, I, our More Voices audio CD for the More Voices project, we put together an audio CD, which includes pronunciation from native speakers for as many of the songs as we could pull off. So that is available for that part of the collection. You know, increasingly today, what I'm finding is YouTube itself is a fabulous source, not always, but but still, if there's a song in a, a West African language and you want to know how to pronounce it, you can often find a video of native speakers singing that and that that can help, too. So. We don't tend to think of those kinds of things. I think part of our work going forward will be to continue to create audio files and so on um, for the resource. And that's the beauty of the digital platform. We can expand and add more materials like that. So it's definitely on our radar. I do think to go a little bit with that, what David Roger was saying as well, when we say that we want the whole community to sing, we really want to put hymns in the collection that people, that the, that the community feels comfortable singing. So not just something that would feel comfortable for an Anglophone community to sing. 
once a month or something like that, which is also the reason why we've tried to put in uh, traditional characters. Like when a language is written out phonetically, it's great for others to sing, but it's not great for the person of that language to sing. So we're working hard to challenge and question the assumption of who will be using the resource. Our, usually we, you go into a hymn, a hymn book with the assumption that it's going to be white European audience, English speaking, who would be who would be using the book. And we're trying to challenge that assumption slowly and subtly and surely with how we are preparing the hymns, but also in the consulting process that we know is very important to do. Um, are there any other questions, concerns, burning, burning thoughts? The question in the chat about the new book going to be totally digital. Well, what, what we're doing is digitizing the three existing collections, Voices United, More Voices, and Was Uni, and, and often there's a piece that's in two collections. So we're harmonizing the scores as much as we can to, to give a, a common score for all of that. The piece, there will be a published component and it's a supplement, a small supplement, roughly the size of, of more voices of new repertoire, the, you know, culling this, all of the submissions and, and previously published material that's come in. So, so that will be published because there are people who are still working out of their books. So that way you can continue to work out of your hymn books and have another book in the pews as well, or you can access the full digital platform and project and, and print. <coughs> Hmm. Je note que Kofi a, a posé une très bonne question, si je peux juste répondre brièvement. Um, uh, en effet, Kofi, uh, vous avez tout à fait raison. Uh, la tradition réformée Kofi, right, est please? en effet plus proche uh, uh, de, uh, de certaines uh, traditions catholiques uh, dans uh, les contextes mondiaux, uh, surtout parce que l'Église catholique a été très proche uh, des éléments de pouvoir, Catholic, uh, si je peux m'en servir de ce ton-là, uh, de colonisation. Uh, on, on reconnaît power, ce, cette histoire-là, uh, mais qui a eu une grande influence dans les autres case, églises uh, qui se sont établies uh, outre-mer et, et dans le monde. Et donc, uh, en effet, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec vous qu'il y a cette nuance-là. C'est pour ça que j'ai soulevé le, le point tantôt qu'il y a un, un, des fois un saveur francophone catholique qui sort dans notre musique parce qu'il y a des influences qui viennent de cette réalité. From that reality. Uh, Kofi, please go ahead. Oui, uh, faisons suite à ce que David yes. Roger vient de dire. Uh, Je vais uh, ajouter based on what uh, David uh, Roger just said, I would like to add. Il y a eu trois traditions that there's a, a, a powerful evangelical tradition that is influencing uh, all, with, all the churches, especially in the South, uh, communities of faith, uh, and the Reformed churches uh, from the South. Uh, uh, they tend to be uh, uh, subsumed in, uh, in to, uh, the, the evangelical movement. But the fact is that uh, Protestants are de still Protestants de in their uh, way of singing, regardless of their origin. It's the, uh, the evangelical tradition that is exerting its influence, and sometimes that uh, gives rise to confusion. Merci pour la nuance, Kofi. J'ai so, Thank beaucoup. you for the distinction, Kofi. I very much appreciate that. I realize that we are coming close to time, so I'll just have another brief pause in case there are any other questions or wonderings or 
burning desires that someone just needs to share into the group, particularly of the committee members that are here. And I also forgot to welcome Tammy Jo, who is the music editor for Gathering, who is also with us. So welcome, Tammy Jo. If there aren't any other questions or wonderings, Paul will be closing us out with a blessing. And I just want to thank everybody for their time this evening, for being with us, and ask that you continue to follow the work of Then Let Us Sing. Go to our website. We'll be posting information there. You can also sign up for our newsletter there. You can follow us on Facebook. You can always feel free to email me or to use the email at then let us sing. My email is asmith at united-church.ca and I'll put it in the chat. We are delighted to be in dialogue with you. I hope that you can tell from this conversation that we are engrossed and in love and passionate about this project. And we believe that it is part of the faith formation of the entire church. And I hope that you can that you can feel how honored well, I know how honored I feel to be a part of it. I am not, as part of our norms, I am not speaking for anybody but myself, but I, I feel like many of us are truly honored to be a part of this project and truly honored to share some of the insights and questions and wonderings that we have been doing and wrestling with and learning from and continuing to grow through together. So thank you for this time and please continue to follow us and also look be on the lookout for our sampler, which will be coming out in the fall of 2023. So please get on that website, then let us sing.ca to find out how you can contribute, how you can be a part, how you can help support the work of then let us sing and to continue the conversation. There'll be plenty of opportunities to continue the many, many conversations that we have been sharing. I'm just going to check the chat to make sure I haven't cut anybody off. So then I'm going to pass it over to Paul, if that's okay with everyone else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lydia. Um, it is indeed a real pleasure to be part of this, uh, both um, the planning and the, the work being done on Then Let Us Sing. I'm the chair of the Marketing, Animation and Funding Committee, and it was our responsibility to find the name. And then Let Us Sing came from our group and got blessed by everybody else. And it's, uh, it, it, we're just really pleased to be part of this. Um, what I'd like to do is finish with a short prayer. And I'm using our, of course, wonderful resource, Voices United. And I'm looking at on page 915 for a prayer for the day's end. Because here in Ontario, in Ottawa, where I am, it's very much the day's end. So let us pray. Dear Jesus, as a hen covers her chicks with her wings to keep them safe, spread out your golden wings and protect us this night. Amen. Amen. And I'll finish with a blessing. May the blessing of God be upon you. May God's love light all your way. May the grace of Christ enfold you and peace around you stay. May the Spirit of God dwell within you. May you live in joy each day. Thank you. Amen. Amen.